Hi, and welcome to episode six. In the previous episode, we concluded by upgrading the vehicle assembly building, and after getting a couple of builds into the building queue, I had enough money to upgrade mission control, which is going to allow me to carry more contracts than just the two I've been carrying so far. And this is my response to one of those contracts. This is Muna 1, and the contract is Luna 2, which is one of the historical contracts packed with the Mission Controller 2 mod. The mission is to get into orbit around the moon, collect some science from that orbit, and then crash the probe into the moon's surface. So the plan here is not to go into low carbon orbit, which is what you would normally do in this type of mission. I'm going to launch straight into an intercept trajectory with the moon. Um, the reason for that is, again, because I have remote tech in, in, installed and I can't stay in contact with my satellite as it orbits around the Earth. So I'm going to go into this steep trajectory and aim straight at the moon for all intents and purposes. Uh, so right now I am warping to get myself to a point where I hope that my trajectory will intersect with the moon. I've done a lot of moon transfers before, so I have a very good idea of how quickly the moon goes, and so I'm visualizing my trajectory. I think that's what you say. It's like, uh, I don't know, what is it, like uh, ski racers that uh, have to visualize the course. That's what I'm doing here now. And I think I'm in the right spot, so I'm ready to go. Now the truth is, I could probably build a full-scale manned lunar mission at this point. I, I mean, I, I got 255 parts to play with that I can launch from. I don't have the weight restriction that I used to have on the launch vehicle. I definitely have the parts to do it, to send a single person into uh, to, to land on the moon and to come back. But I chose this because I think it's more interesting. And I think the reason, there's a couple of reasons why I think it's more interesting. Number one is the restrictions that um, that I have with communication. I have to have a very unusual uh, mission plan here with this steep ascent and aiming straight at the moon. I wouldn't have to do that if I had a manned mission where I could control the ship the whole time. I also think it's more interesting in that, I don't know, I, I, I have an aversion to just sticking a single Kerbal into a can and then firing them off for a few days at a time, if not longer. And it's what, it's like seven hours, a little over seven hours to get to the moon, a little bit of seven hours to get back, um, and whatever time you end up spending on the moon itself. And I know the game doesn't restrict you in that sort of a way, but to me, sticking somebody into a can, to a small can, for that length of time and making them do complicated things like landing on uh, foreign bodies doesn't feel right to me. So I would much prefer to wait on that until I have the parts to send a, a proper party to the moon. This mission, of course, was uh, modeled after a true historical mission, a Russian mission from 1959, Luna 2. And uh, Luna 2 was the first uh, man-made object to impact uh, an extraterrestrial body, namely, of course, the moon. Um, you might be wondering why why Luna 2? Uh, what, what about Luna 1? Well, there was a Luna 1 that was launched earlier that year, uh, but quite frankly ended up missing the moon. So instead of becoming the first object to land on a foreign body, it became the first object to exit the Earth, uh, Earth-bound gravity and end up orbiting the sun. And here we are as we're approaching Apoapsis. I set my uh, Apoapsis at 12,000 kilometers because that is the moon's altitude. But that altitude for the moon is measured from the center of Kerbin while the Apoapsis is measured from Kerbin's surface. So really, I am 12,600 kilometers from Kerbin's surface. So that's why the Apoapsis as you can see, projects out past the moon's orbit. But to be honest, this works out really well because what it does is it gives you quite a bit of hang time out here. And that hang time is great because it'll, it gets you sort of stalling while the moon has time to catch up with you and you have that opportunity of falling into the moon's gravity well. So now I'm just sort of waiting and hanging for this to happen and there it is. And I'm looking at that and that 
is more than acceptable. That is pretty sweet. I should be able to turn that well into an orbit. And in fact, this came out to be came out much better than I thought it was going to, to be honest. I knew there was a good chance I might just miss altogether. But not only that, I have a really solid communication link with Kerbin. You can see there the red dot where the Kerbal Space Center is. It's towards the eastern horizon. And so it's going to be there for hours uh, as I approach the moon. The only thing that's going to sever my communication is going to be the moon itself when I drift in behind the moon. But I could easily burn myself into a capture before that. So here we're coming into our capture burn. Um, normally you would be doing this at periapsis, but periapsis is in the communication shadow with Kerbin. It's in behind the moon, so, so that's not going to work. Um, instead I'm going to do this burn out here where I can still see Kerbin. So I'm in this nice view where I can see both uh, the moon and Kerbin, and as long as I can see Kerbin, I can communicate with it. So, but doing the burn from out here is not going to be a problem. I got plenty of fuel. Again, I'm using this combination of burning radially and burning, in this case, retrograde, because I do want to slow myself down so I get myself into a capture. And after a little bit of time, uh, I got myself into a nice orbit. And now it's science time, which is part of this particular contract. Uh, I didn't bring along a goo container or a materials bay because the transmission return on those are pretty poor. I'd rather just bring those home with me, and I'm not going to be bringing this probe home. So instead, I thought I'd try out this orbital research scanner that comes with the Mission Controller 2 mod. I'm not quite sure what it does. I'm pushing this Start MC Orbital Research button, and I get a little message down there at the bottom, but nothing really seems to happen so I eventually just kind of give up on that and do the log orbital reconnaissance which gives me a nice 36 science to transmit and uh, so yeah I'll send that home and then move on in the meantime it's time to visit uh, JunkSat1 if you remember JunkSat1 from the last video that was my first satellite to be put into orbit and it had to stay in orbit for 21 days and five hours and some odd minutes and that time is pretty much up so now it's just time to wait it out and uh, finish off this contract and that contract requirement goes green and that finishes this one off and back at KSC we now have the funds to upgrade uh, our tracking station so this is going to give us maneuver nodes and patched conics so that's a very exciting development that's going to definitely definitely help us out and we are also going to pick up some science uh, specifically here I'm going to get the advanced flight control uh, mostly for that uh, improved probe body And back at Muna 1, we are enjoying the view as we time warp our way around the moon to get ready to do our burn to deorbit this thing. And of course, who doesn't enjoy a good crash? So let's watch this thing go down. And now it's on to JunkSat-3. Now the mission with JunkSat-3 is to put it into an inclined orbit. It's not a very high orbit to get to, but it's supposed to be inclined at 4.1 degrees, which is not much. But why make that inclination change in orbit when you can make or launch yourself into that inclination right off the bat? Now the key to launching into the right inclination is to get the is to launch at the right time, and that's when the Kerbal Space Center is underneath either the ascending or descending nodes. So when you can see the orbit like it is here, and you can actually see the ascending and descending nodes, the easiest thing to do is to make sure you have Kerbin selected so that you're right centered on the orbit, and then line up the two nodes like I'm doing here, and that gives you where you want KSC to be when you launch. The other thing to notice here as well is that uh, we are going to have to launch to the north 4.1 degrees. You can see as we go from left to right that the orbit goes up. So that means um, north is 0 degrees, east is 90 degrees, so i got to be 
a little less than 90 degrees. So I'm going to launch at a heading of probably around 80 degrees would work out really well. And I'm going to watch my inclination and uh, zero on in on the inclination that I want. But despite all that planning, this mission was almost over right at the get-go. Uh, with this Rocklemax engine that I put on the side that has to be tested in a suborbital trajectory, um, I guess it was enough to throw the aerodynamics off or the weight off just a little bit so that when I wasn't able to get the flight computer engaged quite fast enough, this rocket lost control quickly. But <laughs> thankfully I was able to get it back under control, back on, back on, close enough to the trajectory that I wanted, and everything came out okay. And here we are finishing off our orbital insertion using my usual ways. And then, uh, yeah, there was some science to collect and some other things to do. There was quite a lot of contracts that got uh, banged off with this one. And bolstered by these successes, I decided to take on something a little more challenging as far as an orbit goes. And that is one of these, Mol uh, not Molnina, but Colnina orbits. Of course, the Molnina orbit... Um, which uh, uh, is, is, is an actual type of orbit where you put a satellite into a very highly eccentric and high inclination orbit. And these orbits uh, got started around in the 60s uh, because what they end up doing is because of the high eccentricity, the satellite will be going fairly slowly when it gets to apogee. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this as going around the Earth because it is a real thing. And uh, since it's going very slowly, you've got some time to examine what's underneath you. So if you want to examine what's going on in a particular hemisphere, and for the countries that were launching these things, that hemisphere would have been the northern hemisphere, and you want to get a good look at them, or for certain communications as well, they were useful, but they were also very, very useful for spying on, uh, on anybody that you might want to spy on. Once again, we're going to launch straight into the inclination that we want by lining up the uh, Kerbal Space Center with either the ascending or descending nodes and then launching straight up. Now, I made the decision to want to launch north because I wanted to, I've, I've, I've worried that if I launched south, I would end ended up losing communication before I got anywhere near uh, periapsis. So I'm going to launch northwards into the inclination that I want. I want the inclination to be uh, 63.4 degrees, which means if you you got to go at a heading that's far, far closer to being north than to being east, and, uh, and pulling that inclination up towards you. So I'm watching the inclination on um, Kerbal Engineer, and uh, yeah, getting my apogee up to where I need it to be. And here we are finishing off our burn to get our apoapsis up to where we want to be. And now it's time for our insertion burn. But instead of waiting until I'm up there at apoapsis where I may or may not have communication with KSC, I'm going to take advantage of some of the unlocks that I've had and I'm going to be using a maneuver node. So, excitement, a maneuver node for the first time. And what you might also see popping up there is a new window up at the top left called precise node and although I can still drag the maneuver nodes around the way you normally can I also have this precise node which gives me very precise controls on the directions of my burn. I, ha I can adjust things prograde, normal and radially, I can adjust the time and the best place to put the node is actually right where the um, right where the orbit that I'm on intersects with the orbit that I want. And then with that, I can tweak this to my heart's content until I get this exactly the way I want it to be. And then life gets even better because the flight computer that comes with remote tech actually gives you a button that simply flat out executes whatever node that you set up then it's just a simple matter of warping to when the burn's ready to begin. As much of a luxury as this is, it actually is necessary with remote tech because remote tech takes into account a signal delay and the further away you get from curb and the longer that delay gets until the point where this becomes the only practical way to execute any kind of a maneuver.
Now I couldn't do two whole episodes with only unmanned missions, and Jeb has been just itching to try out this prototype VTOL. So we are in a simulation mode, so anything that happens uh, is not going to count, so that is a good thing. And the only cost to me is the cost of actually running the simulation. Now I'm going to say right out, I, I feel I'm all right at all this orbital maneuver stuff, but where my weakness lies? Well, that is in flying. And flying things like VTOLs like this one, even doubly so. Now the big thing about a VTOL is that you need to make sure that that center of thrust always remains right lined up with the center of mass. And the easiest way to accomplish that is to build everything um, symmetrically about the center of mass. And you can see that I do that. I got the four fuel tanks uh, uh, fueling those jet engines and uh, everything is, is is symmetric so that as the fuel runs out that center of mass doesn't move and uh, this thing remains relatively stable. So anyway, I thought I'd end this video with you watching my attempts in this simulation to work this, this uh, VTOL around and try and do a couple of landings. And my goal here seems not too complicated one. All I want to do is put myself down on the launch pad. This whole thing, of course, is running at two times speed. Okay, so that didn't go quite as planned. But Jeb remains undaunted, and it's time for a second attempt. But neither of those two attempts compare to my attempt to land this thing on top of the vehicle assembly building. And I think that this one deserves to run full speed, no commentary. And as Jeb crawls out of the remains of his craft, two thoughts come to his mind. Number one, can he please try this thing again? And number two, exactly who was the contractor we hired to build these buildings for us? <laughs> 